Well, welcome to week three in our series on Esther. And uh, if you're just joining us, we've entitled the series, You Were Made for This Moment. And that title actually came from Max Lucado's book entitled, You Were Made for This Moment. And I know that many of you are using the, the book. I'm not preaching from that book. I'm purposely not even opening that book. I read it probably a half a year ago, but I'm not reading that book so that it doesn't taint what you're going to pick up or not be redundant even in what you're going to pick up on studying it on your own. And uh, I know life, many of the life groups are using it, and some of you are using it as individuals too. I did notice this morning on the life group table that there's probably a dozen books up there yet with folks' names on them who've ordered them. Maybe you weren't here last week, or maybe you ordered them this week. I don't think you ordered them this week. They were here last week. But make sure you pick those up, okay? And I um, really want to encourage you to, to use those and so forth as kind of a supplement to go deeper. Um, I've heard from several of you too, even this morning, so really appreciate this series on Esther. And uh, again this morning, as we look at Esther, I want you this, this morning, we're going to read two chapters of Esther, okay? Chapters 5 and 6. And Esther is one of those books that just, it reads different. It's a story. It's just, when you look at like the Gospels or the Prophets, they take different topics and the chapters have different themes and so forth. When you look at Esther, it's like reading a novel. It's like reading a story. And uh, I want you to not only see that this morning, but what I really want you to see this morning as we look at these texts is how God is on the move, okay? And if you're taking notes, you can jot that down. I think it's even a new version um, in the slides in there. But God is on the move. And if you, you, if, I want to go back and repeat what we did the last two weeks, and I said I wouldn't do that last week. Um, this morning where we find ourselves, and if you did miss the last couple of weeks, I encourage you to go back and listen. Um, you can get them on YouTube, and you can get the full service, or you can get just the sermon. So your choice, but go back and listen, because it's like picking up a book and starting in the middle. If you miss the first part, where's it at, right? It's not like a Hallmark movie where you can pick it up in the middle and you know how it's going to end, right? This you have to kind of go back to the beginning. But to make the beginning pieces that you may have missed short, Esther is a Jewish girl. She's more or less an orphan. Her parents died. She's probably second or third generation. Her family was taken out of Jerusalem when King Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and he took them over to Babylon. Now, she's second or third generation. Her cousin Mordecai, this is back in chapter 1, is a official more or less. He's got a government position somewhere outside of the palace near the gates. Somehow, in God's plan, God positioned him there for such a time as this. But he's got a position where he has some... Uh, he's, he has some insider information. He's got his ears to the ground, if you will, and God is using him in different ways, right? Well, one of the things is he adopts his orphaned cousin, Esther. Esther's dad is now Mordecai, right? So, we know what happened to King Xerxes is in charge. Nebuchadnezzar is out of the picture. King Xerxes is in charge of the Persian Empire. There's about 127 provinces. They've had these banquets. The king held his banquet, invites the queen, Queen Vashti, to come to the banquet. She says, I'm not coming. That creates all kinds of chaos. This queen's got to go. He calls for a new queen. It's Queen Esther. Esther, and there's a lot of things I'm missing in between there, okay? Go back and read it or listen. This morning, Esther is queen. Esther's had, there's, there's banquets and so forth, right? We'll pick up in the story. But Esther's queen at the same time, there's a plot, or I should say, there was a plot to kill the king, okay? This is a little bit of background here. We didn't talk about this last week. But there's a plot to kill the king, and there's a plan to kill the Jews, the Jewish people. This is where we pick up the story starting in Esther chapter 5. Now, one of the things I want you to picture here before I look at it is Esther is asked by Mordecai to go in and talk to the king and tell him what's going on about these plans and plots. And Mordecai, her dad now, okay, former cousin, now her dad, says, Esther, 
Here's the thing. If you go in and talk to the king, you know what can happen. You know the rules. If you go in without asking to speak to him, you can be killed. That's the rules. You don't go in and just simply open the door and talk to the king. You have to be invited. And even if you're invited, the king needs to raise his scepter to show that you're welcome. If the king doesn't raise his scepter and you didn't have an invite, you're as good as dead. And Mordecai says to her, look, if you don't do this, you're probably going to be dead anyway because you're a Jew and the plan is to kill the Jews. You get a picture of the tension and what's at stake? How is God moving in this story? You want this girl? Is this your plan to go in and risk my life? When the rules of the Medes and the Persians is signed with signet rings, meaning it can't change. And you think that my going in there might possibly change his mind? That's some of the background to this text this morning. Esther chapter 5. Esther's request to the king. On the third day of the feast, or of the fast, they were fasting, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court of the palace, just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance when he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court. What could happen? Right? I just shared with you. It says, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her, and he held out his gold scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. Then the king asked her, What do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. And Esther replied, If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to a banquet I've prepared for the king. All they did that time was eat. There's a lot of banquets, right? Like I said before, fellowship, huge, right? A lot of banquets, a lot of, a lot of fellowship. It says, the king turned to his attendants and said, tell Haman to come quickly to a banquet as Esther has requested. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet. While they were there drinking wine, again, the king said to Esther, now tell me what you really want. What's your request? I'll give it to you even if it's half the kingdom. Esther replied, this is my request and deepest wish. If I have found favor with the king and if it pleases the king to grant my request and do what I ask, please come with Haman tomorrow to the banquet I'll prepare for you. Banquet today, banquet tomorrow. Then I'll explain what this is all about. Then we get Haman's plan to kill Mordecai, Esther's dad. Haman was a happy man as he left the banquet. But when he saw Mordecai sitting at the palace gate, not standing up or trembling nervously before him, Haman became furious. However, he restrained himself and went on home. Then Haman gathered together his friends and, and, and Zeresh, his wife, and boasted to them about his great wealth and his many children. He bragged about the honors the king had given him and how he had been promoted over all the other nobles and officials. Then Haman added, and that's not all. Queen Esther invited only me and the king himself to a banquet she's preparing for us. And he's invited me to dine with her. She's invited me to dine with her. And the king again tomorrow. Then he added, but this is all worth nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew just sitting at the palace gate. So Haman's wife, Zeresh, and all his friends suggested, set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall, and in the morning, ask the king to impale Mordecai on it. When this is done, you can go on your merry way to the banquet with the king. This pleased Haman, and he ordered the pole set up. Can you just feel the tension in there? How things were done? Moving on, it says, the king honors Mordecai. Remember Mordecai's the guy who wouldn't bow down to Haman? The king honors Mordecai. When Haman, there's a death plot now for Haman. 
It says, that night the king had trouble sleeping, so he ordered an attendant to bring the book of history of his reign so it could be read to him. In those records, he discovered an account of how Mordecai had exposed the plot of Bithynia and Theresh, two of the eunuchs who guarded the door to the king's private quarters. They had plotted to assassinate King Xerxes. What reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this, the king asked. His attendants replied, nothing's been done for him. Who's that in the outer court, the king inquired, as it happened. Haman just arrived in the outer court of the palace to ask the king to impale Mordecai on the pole he had prepared. So the attendants replied to the king, Haman's out there in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. So Haman came in, and the king said, What should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? Haman thought to himself, Whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So he replied, If the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes, as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden, one with a royal emblem on its head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. And let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robes and led through the city square on the king's horse. Have the officials shout as they go, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. Excellent, the king said to Haman. Quick, take the robes and my horse and do just as you have said for Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the gate of the palace. Leave out nothing you have suggested. So Haman took the robes and put them on Mordecai. He placed them on the king's own horse and led him through the city square, shouting, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. Afterwards, Mordecai returned to the palace gate. But Haman hurried home, dejected and completely humiliated. When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends what had happened, his wise advisors and his wife said, Since Mordecai, this man who has humiliated you, is of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. It will be fatal to continue opposing him. While they were still talking, the king's eunuchs arrived and quickly took Haman to the banquet Esther had prepared. It's a long story, and we're going to end there. We'll pick up more with it in the next two weeks. But what I want you to see in this is how God has a plan. And I know we read that long text rather quickly, but if you go back and you look at that, there's pieces and people, palaces, banquets, robes, honor, disrespect. All of these things are moving to complete a story to complete God's plan. As the story unveils, you can just see, if looking back, if you will, how God reveals his plans over courses of time. There's a plan in motion, right? Last week we talked about decisions, 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 and how even today there had to be decisions made in each one of these things. Would Haman obey the king? Would the king honor Esther? Would Esther go in, right? There's all of these decisions. But once the decision is made, there's a plan in motion, and God brings people to a place where he has them make these decisions so he can complete his plan. You don't see God mentioned his name anywhere in the book of Esther. And as I said last week, sometimes isn't that how we feel? We just don't see God. But God is moving all of these things, putting them in place so that his plan can prevail. If you go back and you look at Esther and you look at the intricate parts looking back, you can see how he put this person in place to make this thing happen over here. And it happens over time. And it didn't happen as predicted. Haman, who was the second in charge, wanted Mordecai to bow down to him. That's what infuriated Haman is that Mordecai would never bow down to him. He's second in charge to the king. Mordecai should have bowed down, but Mordecai said, I'm not bowing down to you. There's nationality tensions here. There's power struggles here. There's narcissistic kings. 
There's beyond stubborn leaders. And then there's people who are resolute in their faith who never compromised. One of the things that I want you to see is how God can use bad situations and even bad people to bring about good. Don't you wonder where that leaves us today sometimes? How can some of the situations that we see, can we go, how can this happen? They're, they're incomprehensible to us. They're irreprehensible to us sometimes. And yet when we look back, we see how God used evil to bring about good. How God used faithful, obedient people, resolute people, who never compromised their faith to be part of the story. Ordinary people, less than ordinary people, people who were taken out of their homeland, put into captivity, people who were orphans, brought into a palace to become a queen. Could Esther have seen it? Could Mordecai have seen it? Could Haman have seen it? Could Xerxes have seen it? No. Who understands the mind of God, huh? Who understands the mind of God? When I watch the news, and I I probably shouldn't, I tend to watch Lester Holt. Maybe some of you watch Lester too. And as he's reporting the news and the war, and I hear some of the things that are happening to these prisoners, the hostages who've been released, and you hear what they've gone through, and you hear of a seven-year-old who was shot. Her life wasn't, they said, her life was saved, but her real life was taken from her. And I see the rebel attacks, and I see a, a tanker yesterday that was hit by a missile. I won't even go into the details, but maybe you saw the story this past week of the lady in Muskegon who starved her child to death. I was angry. And I'm working on a message saying that this is going to turn out for good. God, what's what's your plan? What's your plan in this? So many things don't make sense. I think that's exactly where Esther and Mordecai found themselves. This doesn't make sense. Looking back, we see that it did make sense. God did make sense out of it. You were made for this moment, is the title. Esther was made for the moment. A moment of decision. A moment where God was going to use her, perhaps in ways that she could have never seen. And I don't think she could have ever seen where it was all headed. Mordecai, made for this moment, adopts his cousin. Now he's her dad sending her to spend time with the king. She becomes the queen. Could he have seen it? I don't think so. We can see it. We know where it was going. Could Xerxes or Haman, could Haman see he was going to be impaled on a, on a pole? You talk about a guy that was all about himself because somebody didn't bow down to him. God used them. Maybe one of the things that I should point out in here is that God uses every person somehow to complete his plan, doesn't he? The good and the bad. And I'm not trying to say the bad people. God uses everybody. You and I are not here by chance, are we? Some people believe in fate. Some people believe in the stars. We need to believe in the one who created the stars. Put every one of them in place. Put his world in the place and put us in the world. Do you believe that God has a plan? It's okay to talk in church. You're going to do lots of talking tonight over the game, especially if the ref has a bad call. You won't be saying nice things if it's against the Lions. And I do hope they win tonight. Do you believe that God has a plan for all of this? 
Do you believe that God has a plan for you? Do you believe you know that plan? We don't, do we? We don't. What are you going to do in your made-for-this-moment moment? How will you respond? Maybe the better question is not so much as what's God's plan, but how, how, how are you going to handle that plan? How do you and I move into tomorrow, into the unknown? You know, we leave here today and we hear this and, and we, we, we see the story and we're like, okay, God, what are you going to do with me? Would I have known 25 years ago this year that I'd be standing up here? No. When God called me to go back to seminary, I thought it was crazy. Some of you still think it's crazy, don't you? I still question it sometimes. What do you want, God? Five years ago when we thought my life was over in an accident, could I have seen where it was going? Could I have ever seen God's plan for transplants? And I know there's three of us in here, Phil, Doc, and myself. Maybe more we don't know about. Could a person who was born back then know they would be the donor for somebody like me or Doc or Phil? How did it ever end up during COVID that I could be the third person during COVID to get a transplant? I look back and I didn't think it was ever going to happen. And I look back and I said, God was moving. God birthed a person. I don't know who it was, how old they are, but before me or maybe after me, but whoever it was, God birthed them so they could give a kidney. My point is not about me. You all have stories. You all have stories of what God has done in your life. When you look back, I hope that every one of you can see God was there, God was there. He put that spouse in my life. He put that child in my life. For David and Jenna, he put Nick you in their life. Nurses, doctors, feeding tubes. So that baby could be here this morning healthy and well. God had a plan. See, God's not done with us yet, is he? He's not. Maybe, maybe it hasn't worked out the way you've wanted it. I talked about that spouse in your life. Maybe that spouse left. Maybe that spouse died and you're alone. Maybe childbirth didn't work out the way you've wanted it to or you've lost a child. A couple of you have lost cousins and moms this past week. That wasn't your plan to lose grandma this week. But God had a plan to take her home and left a legacy of love for us to live by, an example, huh? Maybe it hasn't worked out the way we've wanted it to. Maybe sometimes it's because God ordained it different or sometimes it's because we didn't listen and we made our own mistakes. But I want you to know this morning, God's not done with you yet. God's not done with me yet. Our story isn't finished, is it? If you believe He has a plan and you believe you're part of the plan, He's not done with you. The question is, how do you move forward trusting in his plan? Let me give you several things this morning. The first is this. Look back. Just look back. Look back at what he's brought you through. And I trust that every one of you, and if if you can't find that, talk to somebody else and say, can you tell me how you think God moved in my life? Share those stories in your life group. Maybe that's a good thing before the game tonight. Maybe that's one of the questions as you're going through the study is where can you undoubtedly look back and see that God has, has, been, has moved in your life and he's not done with it? Look back. Look back. 
Psalm 1200, and, and, and I want us to just look at Esther, right? Because God is not mentioned in Esther. I want us to look at some other pieces of the Bible, old and new this morning. Psalm 126 verse 3 says, The Lord has done great things for us. That's the psalmist. Who did the psalmist write that to? The psalms were Israel's hymn book. Who's Israel? The Jewish nation. The psalmist writes, The Lord has done great things for us. He's testifying. Well, how did he know that? He looked back. He has done great things for us. Then the psalmist says, so we are filled with joy. (laughs) Esther could see the joy when she looked back. Mordecai could see the joy when he looked back. We've got to look back sometimes. We've got to look back. The second thing is look forward. Look ahead. Don't fear the future. I, I know I, I get nervous about the future sometimes, right? And maybe that's just because some of the things I've experienced that I worry about health and I worry about everything. Any of you ever worry, worry warts? Huh? We just tend to worry about things, right? This past Monday night in our devotions for the council meeting, the ministry team meeting, remember opened up the devotions with Matthew 28. And the last words Jesus says, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age, right? I took that with me all week as rescheduled meetings from last week and canceled meetings, and right? God's with you. God's got it. Just calm down, Randy. You got to look back to see where he's been, but look ahead. Look ahead. Look forward. Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love and are called according to His purposes. And we know. Well, how do we know? Because we can see. We look back that He's called it for His purposes. 1 Peter 1, 6 says this, So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much joy and praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole earth. There's a whole message there for another day. Look back, look forward. Third is look up and pray. In our text, it talks about Esther fasting, huh? Fasting was an Old Testament practice. They fasted and they feasted. They did a lot of both. They put ashes on and and burlap, and you know they saw that they did this. Mordecai did this in front of the, the temple. It's like, why is this guy running around out here in front of the temple with burlap on and he's mourning and he's right? They're in they're in sadness. They wept over what was going on. The New Testament calls us to pray. It calls us to pray. Look up. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says, be truly glad there's joy ahead, huh? Yeah. New Testament, Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Worry wart. Instead, pray about everything. I added the worry wart. Okay, that was not in there. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank Him for all He's done. And the fourth is look inside. I think when Esther, when Mordecai, when they were faced with decisions and trying to figure out God's plan, they took a deep look inside and said, who am I? Who am I? You know, our real identity is not citizenship of the U.S. or Canada or whether we came from the Netherlands or Ireland or whether we came from Germany or wherever, right? Yes, that's part of our, 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 our makeup. 
But you and I are children of God, sons and daughters of God, adopted. Just like Mordecai adopted his cousin, we are adopted by God. We are signed, sealed, delivered. It's a done deal in our baptism, in our profession of faith. We belong to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough, right? That is scriptural too. Height nor depth nor width can separate us from the love of God. That's who we are. And sometimes I think when we're, we're in these situations where we're wondering what God's going to do and what we're going to do, we look to the world for answers, and I think that's good too because I think God speaks through two places. He speaks through His Word and He speaks through His world. We can learn from our past experiences But sometimes we forget to look inside. We forget who we truly are. And when I say to look inside, the two points that I want to make here are this. We have to be still and be patient. Time after time in Scripture, Old Testament, and even in the New, I read it with, uh, um, I read it with uh, one of our members this week, um, in a pastoral care visit. Psalm 37, I think it's verse 5. To be still and know that I'm God. I admit, I'm not always good at being still. It's just to be still, look inside. When we're faced with these things, when we're faced with whatever's not going right or what God is doing, you can't just look back, you can't just look forward, you can't just look up, you got to take a look inside. Am I really still? Actually, I do have it. 37 7. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for Him. We've got to trust God, don't we? If we can't trust God with the future, where are we, right? Trusting God. Proverbs 3 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He'll make your path straight, right? Can we just remember that? I don't know what the future holds for you. I don't know what the future holds for me. I don't understand all of God's plans. His ways are higher than my ways. He doesn't call me to understand. He calls me to look to Him and be faithful. He calls me to remember that He's with me always. He calls me to remember to trust in Him always. Don't lean on my little pea brain understanding. But in all my ways, acknowledge him. And he promises he'll make the paths straight. The fact is, he has you and I exactly where he wants us, or we wouldn't be here. And his plan is in motion. Because you and I were made for this moment. Be faithful, obedient, and trust the future to Him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thanks for Your Word again this morning. I think all of us can relate to Esther's story in some way. We live in a, a world where we don't understand. And that's a good thing, too, because if we understood, we probably wouldn't like it. We'd try and change it, and we'd mess it up. So, Lord, thanks for your plans. Thanks that we're part of those plans. Help us not so much to see what the plan is, but to see that you are in the plan and that you have a plan and that you will complete your plan as we are faithful. So, Lord, bless us as we process this this morning and bless us as we try to live it. In Jesus' name, amen.